Welcome to Conquering College Costs. I'm Frank Palmasani. Hopefully, you've had an opportunity to watch the introduction. This particular seminar is going to focus on every possible way that you can get your college sticker price reduced. So as you are viewing the seminar, what I would like you to think about is knowing your son or daughter. What are the areas that you should be concentrating on? If you file a document, now I'm going to talk about this document later. The document is called FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Regardless of your income, regardless of your assets, your son or daughter is going to be able to borrow money. They're not going to be able to borrow an unlimited amount of money. But in freshman year, it's $5,500 as the maximum, $6,500 in sophomore year, $7,500 in each of junior and senior years, and a few more dollars if indeed they go on beyond four years. Ultimately, this is a student loan, a direct loan, that is written in the student's name. The parent has no legal responsibility on the repayment of the loan. And now we have a new series of repayment options once the student has graduated. And so it is an attractive student loan, and it might be a method that you would want to use to reduce your sticker price. So you'll file the document, and automatically you will become eligible for this particular loan. The other element of eligibility is typically the opportunity to work on a college campus if you file the document. Now, it is true that there are some students that are eligible for a program that we call federal work study. But many other students who aren't eligible for that program can still find employment. And so it's not, uh, it's not perfect in a sense that we can't exactly determine how much a student is going to be able to earn because different jobs might pay different amounts. But in our calculation, we might want to estimate that a student can earn approximately $3,500 in some cases more, but approximately $3,500 as a way to reduce that annual sticker price. All right, now once you file the document, there's going to be an assessment. And this particular assessment is then going to determine whether or not you're eligible for three, any one of three, need-based grant programs. The first and most common need-based grant program is a program called the Pell Grant. Now, we are going through a new process this year called FAFSA simplification. And one of the elements that they've changed in FAFSA simplification is Pell Grant eligibility. So even though you still have to file this document, which call FAFSA, you're going to be able to know your Pell Grant eligibility excuse me, eligibility, based on an income table that will be produced. It's going to be produced as we get into the fall. Now, it's possible, as you're watching this video, that you've already seen these new Pell Grant tables. They are basically going to demonstrate income levels, size of families, and then determine if Pell Grant eligibility is available and the amount. So in advance of the process, you will know whether you're eligible for a Pell Grant or you're not eligible. I would say this to you. If you learn that you're beyond Pell Grant eligibility, don't assume that you're not eligible for any other need-based assistance because there's two more. One would be if you're a student, if your son or daughter is a student in the state of Illinois, if you reside in the state of Illinois, and attend a school in the state of Illinois, any state-supported institution or private institution in Illinois, then you will be assessed as to whether or not you're eligible for a state grant program that is called MAP. Now again, this eligibility will be tied into the calculation that's going to be done when you file that document we call FAFSA. The terminology that's used in that calculation is your student aid index. The Illinois Student Assistance Commission will assess that index and then determine if you're eligible for this MAP grant. But it's difficult to be eligible for a federal grant and sometimes difficult to be eligible for a state grant based on their income thresholds. However, understand that Every college also 
has a pool of resources that would be need-based, that would be institutional money, money from the college itself. And so it is advisable for you to file that document to determine whether or not the college is willing to provide need-based money to your son or daughter to allow you to reduce sticker price. All right, now let's get into where a number of students, a number of families have sticker price reduced. This goes beyond the scope of the idea of need and now starts moving over to the concept of merit. And this is the most prominent one. The student applies, the student gets accepted, and the institution, the college, is providing merit-based money based on how that student performed in high school, what the student's GPA was, in some cases, what that student's test score, ACT or SAT test score, was determined to be. The institution might look at that information and then immediately, after a student is accepted, provide resources. One of the things that often happens is we have students that are participating in high school athletics. And we know there are opportunities out there for those students who want to continue to participate to perhaps have sticker prices be reduced by indeed playing their sport on the college level. Now what we hear often about is that student that gets a free ride, maybe they're playing one of the major sports, but yet there are many other young men and women who have played in high school, want to continue to play on the college level, and might get sticker prices reduced. So the key there is to make sure that that interest that the student have is made known to college coaches, made known to the admissions people that they're going to encounter. So those potential opportunities might be obtained and can reduce sticker price. Now the third bullet that you see on the screen is really important because obviously your son or daughter may have gifts that are beyond the classroom and beyond the athletics. It might be in art, it might be in music, it might be in theater, maybe they're a leader, maybe they're a volunteer, maybe they're interested in an academic area that is so important to the institution, to the university, that that college might be willing to offer resources. This is a big umbrella. We call these talent scholarships. Now you're going to notice on this slide there are two words that are connected with this concept. Those words are resume and relationship. Every time you have a conversation with a college admissions person, maybe when that person comes to visit your high school, maybe when you're out visiting college campuses, perhaps at a college fair, wouldn't it be advisable to have the student create a professional looking resume, hand that to the admissions person, highlighting these gifts and talents, these strengths, because it's that admissions person that might be able to be a helper, a conduit, someone who can advise the student, advise you as a family as to what potential talent scholarships might be available at their institution, matching what that student's gifts and talents are. One of the things that often happens is this family applies, a student applies to admissions, at, through admission at a particular institution. The institution responds in acceptance letter and some scholarship money. But then the family stops. And what I would encourage you to do is to ask the next question. And the next question is, are there other competitive scholarships? In other words, based on that academic record, the student might be informed that they're getting a certain amount of scholarship money, but then a university might ask them or suggest if they come to the campus and compete, there might be other dollars available. Ask about those competitive scholarships. We also know that there are some universities that offer scholarships for siblings, maybe if there's some legacy involved where the parent attended or a grandparent attended. We also know that if a student is making a commitment to the military, that there are opportunities there for scholarship resources. I'd like to spend some time on this last bullet, independent scholarships. 
we know there are hundreds, thousands of independent scholarship possibilities available. Now, a student can go into a national database, perhaps something like FastWeb, and have those scholarship opportunities get matched against that student's profile. Unfortunately, when a student does that, it might appear to be information overload. Indeed, there are so many possibilities. Where do I get started? Here's what I'd like you to do as a parent. I would like you to help your son or daughter by organizing these independent scholarships into three categories. Are they regional? Are they local? Are they national? Local scholarships. Those particular entities that are providing scholarship opportunities from the local area, directly from your high school. Every high school, every high school counseling office will typically list those organizations that every year provide money to students from that high school. Check on those first. Make sure your son or daughter doesn't miss out any of those opportunities because they're going to be competing only with their classmates. And then the regional scholarships, those that might be available in your geographic area, in your community. What you might want to do is not only check the website of your high school, but all of the high schools in your region. Now, it's a bigger pool than these local scholarships, but still somewhat confined. What you don't want to do is have your son or daughter spend a lot of time and energy if they see that the scholarship is national, where they could be competing with everyone else in the country. Or the last concept here that I would like to talk about as it relates to sticker price reduction is very particular in nature. And that is pursuing institutions outside of your state. We know that when we talk about state schools, and I'm not talking about private institutions, I'm talking about state-supported institutions, we know that state schools charge a different amount, have a different sticker price for tuition if you're a resident of that state versus if you are not a resident of that state. But there are a number of states that will demonstrate to you how you can theoretically become a resident to allow your sticker price reduced. So if you're going to have your son or daughter look at institutions that are outside of your state, make sure you ask those schools, do you have a pathway to residency program? All right, now what I'd like you to do is to go over to our next video on the planning phase.